Larry, I'm going to begin by taking full advantage of the fact that you are, without doubt, one of the most qualified people on earth to pass judgment on Ron Howard's new documentary about the Beatles. So what did you think of it? Well, aside from the fact that I'm in it a lot, uh, I loved it. I, uh, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. We, my wife and I saw it at a screening on Park Avenue in New York, and Ron was there. This was back in uh, April. And the one thing that just blew my mind was that I, w- I was getting chills watching the movie. And my wife said, well, why were you getting chills? I said, because somehow through his movie magic and his editing and his sense of story, he was able to bring you right there. And, and people in Australia and, and the United Kingdom and America, all over the world, are getting a feeling of, of really what it was like. And I think that, that in, in history, you can read it in a book, but when you see it in, in, in vivid uh, black and white color film, uh, researched over five years' time, and you're right in the middle of it, and you see what that first pandemonium, that first berserk reaction, uh, the, the catastrophic look on the faces of the young women who thought that each one of them was singing to them, when you when you look at this 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 universal acclaim that they immediately achieved around the world, I mean the Beatles could have solved wars, the Beatles could have stopped fighting, the Beatles could have stopped racial uh, segregation, which they did on one occasion, and they, and and they did such a wonderful job of entertaining the world. And by the way, I mentioned this in my first book, the Beatles came around one month and two days in America after the assassination of the president. There is no question in my mind that they, as a group and as entertainers, were a tonic for that time. Uh, I'm going to jump straight to that question then about their appeal, because the film does suggest that timing played a huge part in their connection with American audiences, uh, that they were there providing escapism from everything that was going on at the time, you know, the civil rights unrest and the Cold War, the beginnings of Vietnam, and of course the aftermath of JFK's assassination. Do you agree totally with that, Larry? Not totally, but partially. I think that a lot of young people who started worrying about going into military service, uh, a lot of people who, you know, we had the draft then where they, where they could just uh, conscript, conscript you right into service. As, as Britain had what was ending, I think, by 1965 or 1966, as Australia had, as many countries had, uh, and people were worried. And I think the Beatles' music was so happy, it was so joyous, but I'll tell you what the main appeal of the Beatles were. Having spent all this time cooped up in an airplane with them, in hotel suites, in, in playing a decoy for them in cars that were cru- whose roofs were crushed, uh, being with them and learning about who they were, what you saw on the stage most often was what you got in private. And that's four young men with a tremendous sense of humor and with a, uh, a remarkable uh grasp of internet. I mean, these are people who are 20, 21, 23, and 23, who are able to understand the world as it was. And how did they get this worldliness so quickly? Uh, Coming out of a town like Liverpool, where there was controversy constantly, uh, coming out of a nation where debate is a a blood sport, uh, where politics is uh, is as uh, popular sometimes, not all the time, as football where uh, when you look at the nature of the country, these were four intellectually curious men who liked me for one reason. I didn't ask them what kind of a woman they, they liked, what kind of hemlines uh, they enjoyed. Uh, did, did, they, did, did they want blondes, brunettes, or redheads? I didn't ask them if their hair was real. Did they wash their hair? Did they shower that morning? Uh, I didn't ask them the stupid, uh, condescending, superficial questions that most of the adult reporters asked them because they thought they were, like I did, they thought they were passing fad. So I asked them questions about all the issues of the time, plus what happened the night before when a woman fell out of an air conditioning duct and almost killed Ringo and herself, and what happened in, in, in a uh, hotel in Kansas City when the kids got through to the uh, emergency elevators and emergency uh, stairways and got through to their floor, and some of us uh, had, to, had to produce a cordon of reporters who protected them. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I asked them about things that were really happening in the world. And the, and the best question answer that I ever got was, would you, if, you were, if you had a teenage daughter, would you let her go to the concert tomorrow night 
in San Francisco at the Cow Palace, and John Lennon said, absolutely not. Are you kidding, Larry? <laughs> so, so, uh, so basically, uh, you, you got this honesty from them and sort of a wonder, a wonder, wondrous feeling about their success. But they did know one thing. They knew they were a great performing band. There was an expression in the day. They sounded on the stage like they sounded on the record. Now, how often today can you say that with perhaps a few artists here and there who can be as great in public, in person, as they are on the music with all the mixing and all the loud uh, uh, music and all the, all the generators? And The Beatles only had very archaic equipment, and this archaic equipment, believe it or not, was used at Shea Stadium. It was used throughout the United States. And the Beatles in the United Kingdom, before they left on their tours, had really performed before fairly small audiences. So their first American tour in 1964 on the big tour in the summer was in the Cow Palace in San Francisco with 19,000 delirious fans throwing, I I guess they call them jelly babies here in in the United Kingdom, jelly beans, which are hard as rock in the United States. And and John Lennon was telling me, "Oh oh my goodness, they were throwing rocks at me. They were uh, they were. I thought I, my eye was going to come out. Uh, they were throwing pins. Uh, it was just like war, and uh, war is hell. But I love seeing those kids. Now, Larry, just to put the spotlight on you for a second, just as the Beatles was a case of them being in the right place at the right time, the same surely could be said of you. <laughs> Did you lobby to get this job, or was it given to you? Were you told to do it? No, I. In fact, it's the exact opposite. When I got the letter from the Beatles inviting me on the tour, uh, and I think I, I think I convinced them to do that because I'm a news guy. I write good letters, and uh, I, 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 I think I talk fairly well. And that, the letter came in inviting me for 35 days, 25 cities, $3,000 in cost to cover everything. And I went to my bosses and said, send one of the popular DJs who will have a ball and who will really do great things for the station. And they said, no, we want a newsman who can uh, tell us a story every day, write the stories. And in, inevitably, they were right about that, but I didn't want to go. I felt it was an absolute waste of my time with all the big stories happening worldwide and locally in Miami where thousands of Cubans were crossing the Florida Straits, some of them dying on the way over to escape Castro, uh, that this was the place for me to be, home. And I told them that uh, why would I, and I say this in the movie, and I'll tell you what I said, why would I, a serious newsman, want to travel with a band, nevertheless a band who might be here in, November, in October and gone in December? And that's, that's a laugh line in the movie. But I was, I was very serious about it. And uh, so I didn't want to go, but my mom, who died that summer, told me without question, this is going to be the biggest thing that ever happened in your life. It must have been quite a discovery for you to realize that though they were a pop cultural news item, that there was in fact substance there, something you had presumably uh, thought wouldn't be there. Well, I think it was, uh, but also what surprised me the most was their intellectual curiosity. These were four people from the third largest city in England, uh, which was not very uh, admired by the people in London. You know, it was those northerners from Liverpool. What, what is Liverpool, and why should we care about them? And there was a lot of prejudice in the music uh, industry in London, the uh, music row here, about the Beatles. Who are they? What do they stand for? One, and I'm not going to say who it was, but one very distinguished music director of a major label said to Brian Epstein, Boy, the boys with guitars will never make it in the 1960s. And they did. And I think that when they did, they surprised a lot of people, notably the people in London and the other cities, Manchester and the other cities of Great Britain, uh, who were astounded by their success. But the, the one person they, they impressed the most in those days was me, because I was very, I mean, John Lennon, the first thing he said to me was, he looked at my shoes, he looked at my hair, he looked at my skinny tie, and he said, who are you? What planet do you come from? You look like a round peg in a square hole. You, my friend, are a nerd from the 1950s. And I looked back at him because I didn't even want to be there. And I said, well, it's better than looking slovenly like you with all that long hair. Right now, I think my hair is longer than at my age. 
longer than theirs was at, in, in 1964, and uh, the hair that I have left. And, and it's kind of interesting that uh, that moment was a seminal moment for me because I started asking him serious questions. He came down the hall, ran after me, grabbed me, gave me a big hug. And John Lennon, by the way, folks, did not give a lot of hugs, especially to men. And he uh, said to me, I'm so sorry, uh, uh, mate. Uh, I, I, wanna, I want you to know we're going to have a great time traveling together. I look forward to answering your questions. Is it fair to say that you bonded with Lennon at that moment? I would say we had a connection. It wasn't the normal connection that you would have with someone uh, that you would meet like that. It's the kind of connection I'd have with the Miami police chief uh, uh, and an adversarial story or a politician. I reckon a lot of people might be surprised in the role that they played in ending segregated concerts in the United States. Can you speak to that for a moment? I'll tell it to you quickly and dramatically. In Las Vegas, I advised them that the Jacksonville Gator Bowl, one of the biggest stadiums in America, would be uh, segregated. Uh, to a man, they, uh, they argued against it. They said they weren't going to do it. There were 19 days of negotiations. Eventually, they, the Jacksonville Gator Bowl was desegregated for the first time. And sure enough, Ron Howard and his amazing crew found a woman named Kitty Oliver who was there as a teenager and eventually grew up to be an historian. And the one thing I will always remember that she said in this film is that for the first time she sat with white people and felt whole like she could look at them and talk to them. And it was such a dramatic change in her life. And, and the Beatles made it happen. They're still, of course, incredibly popular today. How relevant, though, are they today? Well, I think from a music standpoint, uh, they are extremely popular. I don't think they had the adjuration and adulation they had from a uh, passion standpoint, from an emotional standpoint. But to this day, you will find people in their 50s and 60s uh, like a very famous artist who's in this movie who said, I'm still in love with John. I will always be in love with John. Or a 66-year-old woman I met last year at a function I was speaking at who said, George is my guy. He's not here anymore, but I'll always be with him in heaven and on earth. And so there was this, this now it's respect, then it was passion. Uh, plus, a, I, there's a, a contest every year in the United States for National History Week, and I got 600 letters from people at all different junior high schools. These are the same ages that the Beatles kids were from uh, asking me for interviews. So the, the, the magic is still alive. The music never goes away. No group of people, individual or collectively, has ever written the kind of music the Beatles have in mass. You had a very special friendship with John Lennon, and you wrote an acclaimed book about him. I've got to ask, you know, how you reacted to his assassination and whether you have fully recovered from that loss. Well, I went on the air that night. I uh, had a friend of mine, ironically, was hit by a car driving his motorcycle in New York, and he was next to him when he was uh, going. And um, so I, we got a lead on the story, and we confirmed it. And I want to tell you something about news people. Uh, I'm not knocking my business, but we, we tend to forget that the people we talk about who are either killed in the line of duty or in accidents or murders, they're victims. But when it happens to someone you know, and I know this is very, very hypocritical, when it happens to someone you know, it becomes very, very difficult to talk about it on the air. Very. Are you still in touch with Paul and Ringo? Saw Paul at the White House a few years ago when he was honored by the Gershwin, uh, with the Gershwin Awards. Uh, we had a nice reunion, seen Ringo at many of his uh, all-star concerts, done interviews. Uh, with John, it was uh, a lot closer over the years. In fact, in 1975, he came to a marathon to partially raise money for MS, the disease that killed my mother. And he came there, and he was there for a whole weekend on the radio. And then he said, I want to be on television. So if you go to YouTube, you will find the, the strangest weather forecast in the history of American television. John Lennon doing the weather on May 18th, 1975. You didn't get the weather, but you got a lot of John. You're in your 70s and you're still very active as a journalist. Sure. What is it about TV journalists especially that they have such a hard time retiring from the game? Well, I retired as an anchorman 13 years ago. And I, then I did a show, a weekly uh, political show. And then I retired from that. And now I do radio analysis for CBS Radio in Philadelphia on our current uh, election, which is another two hours of conversation. 
And uh, uh, so I just enjoy political analysis, and I'm doing what I like. And here I am uh, in London for the world premiere of a movie that has a lot of me in it, which really shocked me, stunned me. I've never seen myself on the big screen. I've always been at the little screen. And produced by produced by uh, Nigel, How- uh, Nigel Sinclair, Scott Pascucci, Ron-, Ron Howard's company, and a lot of very famous people putting together what I believe is going to be an enormously successful picture that will be, years from now, a critical moment in the history of the Beatles. Larry, given your experience, what do you think of the state of journalism today? And is this the craziest presidential race in your experience? It's the wildest political race in my experience. I've never seen anything like it. I never see, I've never seen things going to the extremes. But I, about the, the, the state of journalism today, there's a very hard line where people throughout the world, in fact, I watched a program this morning uh, on, on one of the channels here, where very few people can make a delineation, a separation between what is fact and what is opinion. So somebody will watch Bill O'Reilly on Fox in the United States and said, yeah, I heard on Bill O'Reilly that uh, Hillary Clinton's got this or she's sick or she's got that. Uh, or they'll watch uh, MSNBC in the United States and they'll say, well, did you know that Donald Trump did this? Well, there's also there's a lot of opinion and there's also a lot of fact. And it's hard to dissect between the two in current day journalism. 